قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha here in Mecca region As usual we'll take three of your emails and then we'll take your live calls bi-idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first question is from a sister. She says, does a daughter become guest at her uh, uh, parental home after marriage? My parents call me a guest whenever I go to my uh, parental home. Islamically, does the daughter hold same right which she had to be to uh, go and be like the same which she had before marriage in her uh, uh, parental home. The question is, what's the difference? Whether they call you a guest or not. And what are the rights they are depriving you of? Basically, there's nothing. Most likely, they honor you more, they would not allow you to participate in house chores as before and would ask your other siblings to do the job as you are there only temporarily for few hours or few days, maybe a week or two, and then you go back to your husband house. So they honor you more. Not that they are depriving you of your rights unless you are insisting on sleeping in your same old bedroom on your bed that you've abandoned for four or five years because you're married with your husband. That is not logical. It's not logical to ask your sister to evacuate the room for your sake. You're just here for a week or two and you want to change everything as it used to be? No, this is not fair. Other than that, whatever they're telling you that you're a guest, meaning that you're honored and you're not expected to work and clean and cook as you used to before, and Allah Azza wa knows best. So don't be too sensitive and spoil things uh, accordingly. Another sister asks, I am a groom's mother and I want to know if my son can take gifts from his in-laws at the time of the wedding which they give with their own wish is it okay to take or we should not take at all what is prohibited in Islam is to ask for dowry from the girl's family this is a Hindu practice. Muslim men don't do this. Real men don't do this. It's the man who's the guardian, who's the financial uh, um, source of the marriage. Allah Azza wa says in Ayah 34, Chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, Al-Rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa Men are guardians and protectors of women for two reasons, because Allah favored them over women and because they spend from their own wealth to provide for their women folk. So real men don't ask for dowry. But at the same time, the Prophet Sallallahu used to accept gifts. And these gifts are unconditional. They're a token of goodwill. It's an expression of love and a good relationship. So if this gift is realistic, 
someone gives the groom a watch, a pen, a wallet, something, a, a set of perfumes, these are normal. There's no problem in that. In Arabia, it is the tradition and the customs that the guests, the uncles, the cousins, the friends, would put some money in an envelope and tuck it in the groom's hand as a gift. This is not a dowry, and it's not from the in-laws, it's from everyone else. So this is permissible. But if the father of the bride gives his son-in-law a car or buys him a house or furnishes the whole house. Now, this is a dowry, without any doubt. A man should not accept this and says, uncle, if you want to give me something like that, please register it in my wife's name. May Allah forbid something happens in the future, it's hers, not in my name. And this is a gift for his daughter. That's okay. So many parents give their daughters um, in, on their wedding night or before that a, a kitchen for her or a bedroom or a living room for her. It's in her name. It belongs to her. Everybody knows this. This is not a dowry and it's a gift and there's no problem with that, inshallah. The third and final question Junaid says, if someone eats something while having doubts that it might contain haram, but they aren't fully sure about it, but that food actually contained haram. In this case, since they had the food without being sure of it having haram ingredients, can this have an impact on their dua? See, the norm is that everything on earth is allegedly halal until proven otherwise. Consume and eat whatever is on earth, halal and tayyib and pure halal for you. And by default, things that we consume, we can consume without checking and without cross-examining because this is a default. Scholars make an exception when it comes to meat. They say you have to know whether it was halal meat or not. If according to the غَلَبَةُ dhan, most likely, to the best of your knowledge, that it is halal, then you have to consume it without checking. As in the case if a Christian or a Jew invites me to a feast. Being a Christian or a Jew, as mentioned in the Quran, whatever they offer us of meat, whether cows, camels, or sheep, this is halal for us to consume. So I don't have to check whether it was slaughtered or not because he's a Jew or a Christian and their food that they present to us is halal. I have to just make sure it's not pork. So to the best of my knowledge, this is halal. I don't need to check. Likewise, if I go to the supermarket, I buy cakes, I buy bread, I buy the default, it is halal until proven otherwise. I don't have to reverse this. It is haram until proven otherwise. No, it is halal until proven otherwise. I have no reason to check. Yes, somebody called me from Norway a couple of minutes ago and said that the bread we buy from the baker, I've asked with the baker and they said, yes, sometimes we do use pork in the ingredients. Okay, in this case, you, you asked. Khalas, you refrain from it. Or you have doubt, you should check. But generally speaking, buying cakes, buying things that are halal on display, a croissant or whatever, I don't have to check if my cappuccino has pork milk in it or not. The default is, is halal until proven otherwise, and Allah knows best. Uh, we have our first caller, Brother Yunus from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Shaykh, uh, my, my grandfather accepted Islam secretly, uh, but I fear that his uh, Christian relatives may cremate him after his death. So 
the thing the thing is if i talk to him i feel that he may be hesitant hesitant to practice islam uh, anymore because he, he maybe accepted a few months 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 ago uh, and uh, i'm only 16 if he now dies and i start to fight with my relatives about uh, how should how he should we how he should how he should be we uh, be buried uh, i may get i may get into trouble so uh, i may get how o- how old is your grandfather uh, 87 or so so is he healthy or you're going to kill him soon he is not that healthy his uh, wife just died he's what his uh, my grandmother died uh, he was 85 uh, she lived just like him and died a few weeks ago. So. Okay, and how is his health? He is in um, he's in pension. He is in uh, in home for the elderly. Not okay. Good. My my advice to you is not to put hurdles. Rather, be positive, proactive. Go and visit him almost every day. Try to speak to him how to elevate his iman. Try to speak to him about the beauty of Islam, the beautiful names of Allah. Talk to him about a little bit of the seerah. Talk to him about one or two ayat of the Quran. Strengthen his iman in the six pillars of iman to believe in Allah, the day of judgment, the angels, the messengers, the scriptures, and in the uh, uh, divine decree, whether good or bad. Try to focus on these things little by little diplomatically so that he would be proud of his Islam, to strengthen his Islam. And inshallah, in a few weeks' time, maybe a month or two, if he gets strong and declares his Islam to his um, uh, children and to those around him, then you can ask him to write a paper or a will not to be cremated uh, after death. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Sayyid from Singapore. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Okay, so um, do I have to redo my salah all over again if I initially attended the fat, fat prayers in a congregational manner where, um, I mean, when I'm about to start off the prayer or even during the prayers, I discovered that on either of my left hand side or my right hand side, there's an empty space which is about an arm, arm's length away and that the, the none of the worshippers decided to close up the gaps which, which is which is on my either of my sides. So the question of Sayyid is is the gaps between the worshippers does it nullify the prayer? The answer is no. It has no impact on the validity of the prayer, the worshippers. So if I'm praying and the man next to me, like in the COVID era, there is social distancing. He is three feet away, one meter away. And the one on the right is one meter away. And neither of them is trying to come close. And if I come close, they run away. So is my prayer valid? Your prayer is 100% valid and you don't have to repeat it. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, Muhammad from the States. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, I've been doing research in regards to lost and found items in Islam. To, to what? The Prophet, uh, uh, in regards to lost and found items in Islam. Okay, okay. Yeah, so the Prophet, al Salam said in an authentic narration, and I quote, Remember and recognize its tying material and its container and make public announcements about it for one year. If somebody comes and identifies it, then give it to him, otherwise add it to your property, end quote. What I wanted to ask you today was, would the same directions apply to lost cats or lost pets or any other type of lost animals? Owners unfortunately lose their cats in my neighborhood often, and I usually find the cats and bring them back to my place. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Wujazakum. First of all, it is not permissible for you to pet a dog. So this is out of the question. Secondly, as for the cat, if it is a stray cat that has no badges, no traces, no marks on it, 
is for you to keep. I have no clue whether this is a domestic pet or a stray cat. So if there's, there are no traces, such as a collar or a tag number or a name or whatever, to prove to me that this belongs to someone, then yeah, it is for you to keep. There's nothing wrong in keeping it, inshallah. Thirdly, it is best, of course, if you know that most likely this belongs to someone and they've lost their kitten or cat and they're emotionally attached to it, that you announce it. And it don't be so cheap. You can get cats elsewhere and ask people to donate who have uh, um, extra cats, and there are so many of them. Fourthly, the hadith you've mentioned about al-luqatah, which is lost and found, this is about property that has value and it belongs to someone that can be identified. So if I found a pen like this, which costs peanuts, you know, pennies, on the ground, I can take it and move on. I don't have to identify it because if people dropped it, they wouldn't go half an hour later to look for it. It's so cheap, it's negligible. But if you found a pen that is worth like $150, something of value or more, you can't keep that. You have to identify the brand, the color, the shape it's in, and then announce around you that, listen, I found an item of some value. So whoever had lost something within the vicinity of this area, please contact me. And you'll get people calling you, say, listen, I lost my watch, I lost my, my wallet, I lost this and that. And you can just simply ignore uh, uh, these calls and say, no, it's not what I found. Until someone tells you, I found a pen. So explain, describe the pen. He says, it's a brand of so-and-so. said, sorry, it's not the pen. Until someone fits the description correctly, and then you can give it to them, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, Yusuf from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, if is enforcing evil and forbidding good and act of this belief because I took the picture yesterday after I think I did that, yeah, I did that and I thought maybe this is cool because I heard you saying it's like a major sign of hypocrisy. So I took this picture and I have it as my profile picture. Do I have to remove it or not? First of all, enforcing evil and forbidding good is one of the characteristics of the hypocrites, as mentioned in chapter 9, Surah At-Tawbah. And they collaborate upon this. And they're allies one to the other. However, this is a style of life and a way of living, not a random act. A random act would be a sin, but not a characteristic of a hypocrite. So I'm sitting in the living room or in the waiting room of somewhere, and I look at the man next to me, and I would like to take a smoke. So I say, fancy a fag, a cigarette, a joint, a fag in the old British way is a cigarette, not that fag. So, fancy one? Okay, now I am enforcing evil. I'm advising. I'm endorsing it. But I'm not a hypocrite. I'm an openly sinner, which might be one of the characteristics of an initiative to be a hypocrite. But it's not part of the uh, uh, um, ideological hypocrisy, rather, is a practical hypocrisy. So your picture that you've snapped and put in your profile, which is haram, this is sinful. But you're not a kafir for doing that. 
and you're not a hypocrite, insha'Allah. However, you're sinful. You have to be careful because such sins accumulate without you knowing it and just before noticing, it's already too late. May Allah protect us all. Anwar from Kashmir. Anwar? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, is my voice clear? Not that clear. Yes, I know. I have some technical glitch. I hope that my question reaches, Sheikh. Inshallah. Okay. So this is question from one of my cousins. He says that his parents like don't respect him. So he says that they don't. Uh, his parents, especially his <clears throat> father, they don't. Uh, they don't treat him well. So he says that I do all the duties uh, and I keep quiet in front of my parents. I don't yell back at them. Uh, I just keep quiet whenever they yell at me. So he says, but I have no love and no respect for my parents. So is this attitude okay in Islam? Barakallahu feekum. And I hope my question reaches. It, it reached, alhamdulillah. And your question is commonly asked by people. Unfortunately, we as parents sometimes fail miserably in our mission and vision statement in the sense that we encourage our children to be undutiful, disobedient, and disrespectful. How? By our own transgression and wrongdoing, by our own bad attitude and the way we deal with our own children. This is haram upon us. We have to fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes, we do have rights over our children, but they're human beings at the end of the day. And we can't ask them or burden them beyond what they can bear. So we have to be sensitive in how we treat them so that we do not lead them to hellfire because of our attitude towards them, which make them go against us and be disrespectful and undutiful. Now, having said that, if a person is tested by Allah by such abusive, disrespectful, bad parents, this is a test from Allah. He will be rewarded for being dutiful and respectful. They will be punished, not because he's your son, it's okay to do whatever you want to do. No, you will be questioned and then you will be tormented and punished for what you had done to your son. So if the son is doing his level best and being respectful all the time, being dutiful all the time and trying to be as obedient as possible, Yet he has no love or respect in his heart. He can't. Simple as that. Is this sinful? The answer is no, providing they do not sense or feel any form of resentment or hatred or disrespect. Because sometimes your eyes can betray you. Your tone of voice can deceive you and let you down if you succeed in not showing them any of such and inshallah there's no sin on you may Allah make things easy for all of us Sumayya from the UK Assalamu alaikum Sheikh um, so once I pray the Asha and inside the yeah, I couldn't remember if I did my second raka'ah and I'll, my, my sister was in, in the room with me and I decided and I think it was a period where I had lots of uswas, lots of doubts in the salah so I made it my third I had the doubt like whether I did my second or third I did my I said this is my third raka'ah and I concluded the prayer and I asked the, my sister 
and she told me that she didn't see me. Now I tried to remember why I made that raka the third, and I couldn't remember whether I was inclined or not. So should I repeat the prayer? Now, take it as a rule of thumb. Whatever doubts you get after the ibadah is over, these are whispers from shaitan, ignore and move on. Example, I am doing tawaf round the Kaaba, and we are in the season of Hajj. I'm supposed to finish seven rounds. On the sixth round, I get a doubt. Is this the sixth or the seventh? Hmm, I could not figure it out. What should I do? Act upon certainty. I'm doubting whether this is the sixth or the seventh. Where is the doubt? In the seventh. It cast the doubt away. So this is my sixth. Finish it. Add one more. That's it. My ibadah is 100% valid. Now imagine I finished my tawaf and I'm going through sa'i. Or I finished my whole umrah and I went to my hotel room. And then I get these thoughts that, did I make six rounds around the Kaaba or seven? Ah, now the ibadah is over. The tawaf is over. And when it was over, I had no doubts. These doubts that are coming up now are from shaitan. Ignore it and toss it in the dustbin. As if they do not exist. Don't pay attention to it. Likewise, after you thought to the best of your knowledge that this is my third and you completed your prayer as such. Finished. The prayer is over. After that, if you get doubts, why did I do this? Why did I assume it was three, not two or four? You ignore such doubts because these doubts came after you made the best of your ability to determine whether it is two or three and acted upon it and finished your salat and your prayer is valid, insha'Allah. Azza wa Jal. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them what to say when stricken with a calamity. Allah says, what means? And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good tidings to the patient who when disaster strikes them, say indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to him we will return. Those are the ones upon whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy. And it is those who are the rightly guided. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, said, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, There is not a Muslim that is afflicted with a calamity who says what Allah ordered him, what Allah ordered them to say. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. To Allah we belong and unto him we shall return. O oh Allah, grant me reward in my calamity and give me something better in return. Except that Allah will give him something better in return. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, continued. When Abu Salama died, I said, which Muslim is better than Abu Salama? The first household to migrate to the Messenger of Allah. Then I said, that supplication. And Allah the Almighty gave me the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in return. Reported by Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. I think we have Brother Yunus from Germany with us again. 
Uh, Sheikh, so I didn't finish my question. I already did this, the things you know. Uh, you said I talk to him about Sira and uh, other other th things uh, to, to have to do with Islam. So the, the, the thing is, if he dies now, and uh, I'm in this situation where his relatives want to burn him, uh, and I'm standing there and say uh, he was Muslim, he shouldn't be cremated. I will get into trouble. I may get beaten up. I uh, I may get beaten up, or uh, I was sent to the uh, psychiatrist uh, three times before because my because my father calls me a hobby. Long story. So, how much effort do I need to invest to prevent them? Is it like when I'm forced to say kufr, where I need to give really much strength? I don't know. I'm I'm nervous. Sorry. So, how much effort do I need to invest to prevent them from doing this? You can't do anything according to the law everything is in your grandfather's hand if he writes a will saying that i want to be cremated then it will be implemented if he writes a will and tells those who are around him and writes a legal document that i would like to be buried as a muslim then it will be followed you as a grandchild in the presence of all of his sons and daughters, have no say. And even if you say that he was a Muslim, they will say, prove it. And you won't be able to prove it. And this is why I said to you in the beginning that you have to try to strengthen his Iman, uplift it, and make him make such a statement and endorse, or not endorse, proclaim and say that he's a Muslim. So that everybody knows what to do afterwards. If he fails to do this, this is his fault, his problem, and not yours, and Allah knows best. Dima from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam to Allah. So on Monday, my class was going somewhere, which is in another city, and usually, like, I would usually not go because um, uh, traveling without a non mahram is not permissible. But uh, if I don't go, I have to um, bring a letter from a doctor that I'm sick. But I'm obviously not sick, so I would need to lie. What should I do in this situation? Neither lie nor go. Just make it a no-show. This is the only solution you have. It is not permissible for us to bend the rules. We have to adhere to the Sharia laws. Women cannot travel without a mahram, full stop. I have a situation, I have to travel. Let's look at the necessity. Is it a matter of life and death? No. It's just maybe I'll lose some marks. In this case, this is not permissible. I may, I may f fail the exam. This is not a matter of life and death, losing an exam or wasting a whole year you will not be questioned in your grave, nor on the day of judgment, why did you fail that subject or repeat that year. You will be asked, why did you travel without a mahram? Why did you lie in this medical report? Muslims don't cheat and don't lie. Alternatives, try to get one of your mahrams on board to go with you. Not possible, don't go and Allah knows best. Fahim from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Sheikh, if I come late to the masjid and the imam is in sujood or elsewhere, what's according to sunnah I should do? Should I wait him for, for him to come back or what should I do? The sunnah is whenever you come to the masjid and the imam is in a particular pillar of the prayer, whether in rukur, whether in sujood, whether in tashahud, you have to offer takbiratul ihram, Allahu Akbar, and follow that imam. Although this rak'ah is not valid, but you must follow the imam in wherever he is. What about if he's in the last tashahud? Say Allahu Akbar and sit and join him. What about if he's going to finish in five seconds? 
say Allahu Akbar and join him. Once he gives salam, you stand up and pray the prayer that you've missed. Isn't it best for us to wait until he offers salam and then join another congregation? The answer is no. You're a latecomer. Don't add insult to injury. You have to join him with, with whatever position he's in and Allah Azza wa knows best. Naeem from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu My question is, someone who is dependent on his family, does he, does he can, can he fast for three days for expiation of breaking an oath or he have to feed 10 people or close 10 people? What, what are you asking about? Are you asking about expiating a broken oath? Yes. And you don't have financial means to feed or clothe 10 people? Yes, because I am financially dependent on my father. Okay. okay. If a person is totally, independent, is, is totally dependent on his parents, he has no savings, no income, he has no financial means to feed or clothe 10 poor people, the answer is, if you break an oath, you have to fast three days and Allah Azza wa knows best. Nazreen from Bangladesh. Nazreen. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, I am experiencing a new kind of liquid discharge which I can't recognize. My question is uh, very long because I, uh, I need to provide proper details. Uh, Sheikh, I can't, I we, we cannot, uh, Nazreen, we cannot entertain long questions. So just give me what is your question. If I need details, I'll ask you. Um, Sheikh, I, uh, I have, uh, generally I have two types of regular discharge outside period. Uh, uh, white or off white normal discharge, nothing accompanied with it, which is the norm from my puberty. And I, I, do not, I do not understand the word of what you said. Sheikh, uh, outside period, I generally... I don't understand what you said. Use proper English, if you please, because you're talking too fast, and I don't understand what you're saying. Okay, Sheikh, I'm trying to make you understand. Sheikh, I experienced two types of regular discharge outside period. Uh, nowadays, uh, I used to have white or off-white normal discharge, nothing accompanied with it, which is a norm from my puberty. But uh, nowadays, I am also experiencing normal discharge accompanied with some liquid water-like discharge, which is new and happening for more than five months and increasing day by day. Uh, Sheikh, the liquid discharge leaves an ashy to blackish brownish uh, stain around the normal white or white discharge on cloth. The stain is not mixed with the normal discharge. It is around the normal discharge. And um, what I have found that on... Uh, I, you, I sometimes keep cotton inside for hours to get rid of the stain on cloth. And once I have found that on white cotton, there is no stain. Although I got, got stain of the liquid discharge on my cloth before inserting cotton and after removing it on the same day. But it may also happen that I haven't experienced the liquid discharge on the cotton then. As Nazreen, I Nazreen, Nazreen. These issues cannot be resolved on live TV, let alone between a man and a woman. First of all, I'll give you the general directions and you have to check with the women folk of your family, the elders, and ask them. The normal vaginal discharges have no color. If there is color, as you're describing black or uh, dark colors, you have to check with your doctor and ask her to do some lab tests and see if there are any infections or not. If she says that these are regular things, there is no infection, such colored discharges would be treated as an istihada, which means that every time the adhan is called, you are, if you want to pray, obliged to clean yourself, change the soiled clothes, wash your uh, private part, make wudu, and you can pray the whole time between the beginning of the salat until the time ends. 
regardless of what comes out of you. It doesn't matter if this discharge continues to come. It doesn't nullify your wudu. Once the time is over, you want to pray the following prayer, and it's the time is due, you repeat the same process, and Allah knows best. Alim from Ireland. Alim. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I normally shop on Amazon. Um, when I make an account, it says, um, like, stuff like, could you read a privacy policy? Or if you make an account, you're agreeing to so and so. So, like, if, um, if, I, if I don't, like, read the privacy policy and I just make the account, is it, is that, is, am I sinful for that? And, uh, uh, like, if, if I buy any products from that, from that account as well, is that sinful as well? Nobody in his right mind would read such agreements that are formulated by the company for legal reasons. And they put all the fine prints and the jargons and the legal terminologies over 10 or 15 or 20 pages. So when you buy products of Microsoft or Google or Apple or Amazon or the likes, they always have this long number of pages of their policies and their agreement and you have to check in. Nobody reads it. And nobody's bounded to uh, um, sign it. You just check it and move on. Put a check and move on. Am I sinful? No, I'm not sinful. I'm not obliged to read such a thing because I can put my own obligations as well and they have to agree to that and they won't agree to that. So ignore it and move on, Akhi. Zainuddin from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh Asim al Are you free? Are you finished? Yes, I am. Okay, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ah. Um, now, from knowledge, we know that gold, pure gold, is impermissible for men. Correct? Correct. So. So now I wanted to ask, are we allowed to use, what about rose gold? It's a form of gold. It's pure gold, but it's mixed with copper. So it's an alloy. Now, we know wearing gold is impermissible, but can we use the rose gold in using it, buying in pens, using um, certain pieces, certain accessories, for example, buying in pens, for example, because they sell rose gold pens. So am I allowed to use the rose gold stuff knowing it's mixed with pure gold or copper? I wanted to ask because would it change the state of the pure gold to a different form and not actually pure gold since it's mixed with something else? To my knowledge, pure gold is not available except in bars or in like 99.99 .99 grams of uh, um, blocks of gold that cannot be molded into a keychain or a pen or the likes because it's too pure. It has to be mixed with copper so that it can be molded and used in other uh, cases. Therefore, the answer is no. Rose gold is haram because it's gold mixed with other ingredients and it is widely used in all aspects, cufflings and pens and key holders and watches and all of this is haram. Abdurrahman from the U.S. Abdurrahman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Shaykh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. My question for today is... Uh, like, you know how uh, reading Tabarak and surahs such as Tabarak and Surah Al-Kahf from week to week and reading Tabarak every day protects you from the grave. Is it permissible to, like, cut it up and read it in, in Salah as well? Or do you have to read it, like, only out of Salah only? It is permissible to read it every night. If you read it in Salat, inshallah, this is applicable as well. But the best is to read it part of your bedtime athkar. When you're at bed, 
you recite this, you recite Surah Al-Sajda as the Prophet used to do, والسلام, and you recite the rest of the Adhkar. This is best, insha'Allah. Muhammad from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu There's an authentic narration attributed to the Prophet Muhammad in regards to hunting, in which he said, and I quote, when you set off your trained dogs, recite the name of God while sending them off, then eat that game, end quote. Now, I know the saliva of dogs are impure, so my question to you is, what would I do with the part or area of the animal that the hunting dog bit? Would I avoid eating that part of the animal? Jazakallah What jazakum? No, you can eat that part as it was not mentioned in the hadith or by the doings of the companions that we should purify it or cut it off or wash it off, which means that as long as the Sharia did not elaborate or address this issue, it is forgiven and neglected, and you move on with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. Fahim from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Shaykh, if we are sitting after Fajr till the sunrise, or we are sitting in Iribab, if someone offers a food or snack, it so happened that in our locality, if someone dies, and when it reach one year, they stay to the Imam to make dua. So after that, there will be a snack. So if I eat that, will it break my reward? If they are collaborating and joining in the masjid on such a snack, which is commemorating a deceased who died a year earlier, this is totally prohibited for you to participate or to eat from it. Because this is collaborating on evil and vice. But if you're sitting there and someone randomly comes and gives you food, this does not invalidate your sitting after Fajr till sunrise or your dhikr, and you can accept such a thing. But it is not permissible to participate and collaborate upon innovation, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. I am afraid that this is all the time we have. Tomorrow, most likely, won't be a live session because the studio is engaged with other projects. So until we meet next Saturday, with the grace of Allah, after Eid, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين